morning, everyone. How are you all feeling this morning? Good. Well, thanks for joining us again. Those of you who are, uh, weren't here yesterday, welcome. Those of you who are back today, thanks for coming back, of course. Um, you'll notice a couple of things. The room's a little smaller, isn't it? And um, there's not a second screen over here because there's a wall. Uh, that's because we were going to have to move about halfway through the program today, so we decided let's just, let's just move now and make it less complicated later. Um, that's one thing I wanted to tell you. Second thing is uh, to remind you that we have uh, both on the Whova app and we have some physical copies, uh, and we will also email them as well. We would love you to fill out our event survey uh, to give us some feedback on the symposium yesterday and today. Um, you can find that on the Whova app, and it's specific to some of the presentations that you were part of yesterday and also will be again today. Third thing, the temperature. Um, we, we sent a lot of messages to the hotel staff yesterday, and they kept coming in and measuring and tweaking the temperature. So we turned it up a little bit, but everybody's got a different thermometer. Um, so just keep letting us know um, how it feels in here, if it's too cold or too hot. Um, but I did see people with hats and jackets and then others who were taking off stuff. So just keep, keep us informed, and we'll do the best we can to uh, make it comfortable for everyone. Let's see. I guess that'll be it for now. We'll talk some more. Um, as I said yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about stimulation, electrical stimulation, and then we started to pivot uh, to some other strategies, and that continues this morning with the uh, trio presentations uh, and then even after. Uh, but there's another part as well, and that's that uh, over the last couple of years, we have made intentional effort to invite uh, younger scientists, uh, student scientists, to present. Uh, last year, that person was Tommy Suter, who's uh, uh, finishing up his PhD at the University of Florida, uh, connected to the good folks at Push to Walk in New Jersey, where he was a trainer prior to going back to school. Uh, and today, there's a couple of the two first presentations. Um, Lana Zoladeva and Alina Garbizov um, are both younger scientists. And so I want you to please welcome Lana, who's going to come. And, and I'll, I'll just briefly also let you know the, the thought process. A few, few people came up to me yesterday and said, I'm, I'm glad that you framed things a little bit. I wish you would have done it before folks spoke instead of after. So before, the whole idea was I wanted to give sort of a, an overview of uh, how stem cells are being applied or investigated or what we are learning about them related to spinal cord injury. And then from that kind of overview, um, which Lana is going to give uh, um, with some specificity also. Uh, but that, we're going to take that to a um, more specific explanation, which Alina will give of what, what is one lab kind of learning and figuring out about particular cells. And then that will be followed by Dr. Ann Parr, which even more specificity. What are we learning about even more specific cells and how they organize uh, what, what we can expect from them. Um, part of this is driven by on the very, on, on one side, um, there's a lot of folks out there in our community who think, or, and, I, and I've gotten messages from them, when, when can I get injected with some stem cells? Like, when are you going to squirt me up with some stem cells? And that's on one end of the spectrum of, of naivete. And so part of that is to recognize not, you know, stem cell is not a stem cell is not a stem cell. There's a lots of different kinds, and there's lots of different theories and strategies and things being discovered about them, and that's important to understand. And again, it's back to this idea of context, strategy, voice. If our community has a better understanding of the context, then we can be more rational and realistic about what's, what our strategy is. If we're going to invest our resources and energy, we need to understand things a little bit better. 
so that we can be more effective advocates. Um, but then I also think it's also just for those who are a little savvier, I think it's a very interesting conversation that we can have today about what this line of study is showing and where it's going. So please welcome Lana. Thank you, Lana. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Is that better? Thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you to the organizing committee for letting me present to you um, some of the work that I've been doing as a graduate student at Drexel University uh, with Dr. Michael Lane, actually. Um, I am now actually a postdoctoral researcher at the Gladstone Institute with Dr. Todd McDevitt, um, and today I wanted uh, to share some of the studies that we've been doing using neural cells to repair the injured spinal cord. Uh, but really, as a young scientist here, I'm here to learn from the audience. I'm here to listen to the questions while uh, letting you know about the questions that we ask as preclinical researchers when using these um, types of and designing these types of studies. And those questions can um, be broken down to who, what, when, where, and why. Um, I wanted to begin by throwing this slide up. Um, this is a cross-section of a spinal cord stained for neurons, just a general stain. And already just from this very simple image, you can begin to appreciate um, all of these different types of neurons that are located throughout the spinal cord. Um, you can begin to appreciate how different they are in terms of size and where they are located, um, whereas these um, dorsal interneurons here up um, in a dorsal spinal cord, and these motor neurons that we can actually track fibers um, uh, that they send out into the periphery and innervate the muscles and actually are responsible for contraction of the muscles. We can also do histological stains for fibers that come down from the brain. And just from this one simple stain, you can begin to appreciate the variety of those signals coming down and innervating the different types of neurons throughout the spinal cord. But really, the reason why I'm putting this picture up is um, to give you an appreciation and a sense of um, not just the motor neurons that are responsible for the muscle contractions, but also all of these different types of spinal interneurons that become crucial to plasticity after a spinal cord injury. And um, we as researchers can actually identify particular types of interneurons. Here's a video of one particular subtype of a spinal interneuron. This, um, these spinal interneurons are called V2A interneurons, one particular subtype, and still displays all of this um, of, uh, heterogeneity. So they're located throughout the spinal cord, and their fibers are sending signals both up and down the spinal cord, also in a very um, heterogeneous manner. So just because we're trying to simplify and just focus on one particular subtype, um, things are still complicated. Apart from neurons within the spinal cord, we know that there are um, other different components um, that comprise the normal spinal cord. And if we were to zoom in um, on these uh, neurons that are uh, wrapped in myelin sheath produced by oligodendrocytes, right, a glial population, um, we also know that all of these uh, glial uh, astrocytes, for example, um, reside within the normal spinal cord. And we know that all of these different types of cells that make up the normal spinal cord change with a traumatic spinal cord injury. And we can model this in the lab. So we know if we are to apply a traumatic spinal cord injury, it results in a um, rupture of blood vessels, for example, and this leakage of these red blood cells that come into the central nervous system when they're not supposed to be there. We also know that these glial cells, they change in morphology, they change in their function, and we know that this um, uh, injury will then also change into a more chronic state. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Usually um, characterized by a cystic fluid-filled cavity in the spinal cord. The reason why I'm using this schematic is to give you an appreciation of all of the variety of the building blocks of um, a spinal cord and the fact that all of these cells change with an injury. 
And when we begin to think about how to repair this injured spinal cord, um, we start to think of uh, different strategies as concepts. So there are primarily two main concepts that have emerged with, throughout literature. There's this bridge concept where um, we can put in growth promoting cells, for example, into the lesion cavity and promote these damaged host neurons to grow through the injury site. Or there's this concept of a relay where we can uh, put donor cells that are inherently rich in those neuronal populations and have these injured host um, cells synapse onto these transplanted cells and these cells for example, interneurons, to relay then the message onto denervated circuits. Keeping these two concepts in mind, we can begin to ask those five key questions. And that's, who are the cells to be used? When considering who, uh, the types of cells to use to repair the injured spinal cord, we have to look at both neural cells, those primary cells that comprise the spinal cord, and the non-neural components. Now within these neural cells, we know that there are neurons and we know that there's um, different types of neurons um, and we know that there are also glial cells, different types of glia. And of course, it's also incredibly important to keep in mind all of those non-neural components, such as the blood vessels and the extracellular matrix that changes with a spinal cord injury. My work in particular focused on these neural cells trying to simplify the, the question. And even with trying to simplify the question, we know that there is a heterogeneous population of both neurons, comprising of motor neurons that have a specific function, and interneurons also having specific different functions. And of, co of course, the heterogeneity of glial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, um, that have, again, specific functions. Now, considering all of these building blocks to repair an injured spinal cord, um, we also have to consider how we are to obtain these cells. I'm not going to go into too much detail because there's a really great summary of all of the, um, this text um, on pages 48 to 51 in the program. But essentially, what I wanted to bring to your attention um, is the language that we as scientists use that we um, often fail to define. So for example, what are stem cells? They, are, um, they have specific characterizations or characteristics. So these are cells that can self-renew, they can divide and produce more stem cells, and they have the capacity to differentiate into all of the different types of cells in the body. If we are to um, go down in uh, the potential to differentiate into all cell cells of the body, we can look at neural precursor cells. So these cells can also divide, but they generate most cell types only of the central nervous system. Going down even further in specificity, we can look at lineage-restricted progenitors, and these are the cells that primarily our work uses. These are the cells that can divide to a very limited capacity, uh, and they only produce either neurons or glial cells. So very different from an actual stem cell. And lastly, as you'll hear um, from Dr. Parr, for example, with the emergence of new technologies such as induced pluripotent stem cells, we need to understand exactly who these cells are. These cells are not of neural lineage. They are cells um, that are generated by changing the genes, such as from, for example, the genes that are expressed in the skin to then um, create a stem cell to then be driven into a neural lineage. So these are incredibly important definitions to keep in mind when we're looking at um, using cells to repair the spinal cord. Um, and with that, the five key questions um, that I wanted to touch upon and discuss are um, the questions that we ask ourselves when designing these preclinical uh, pre studies. First, who are the cells and where do they come from? How do we generate them? What is the intended target that we are to treat within a laboratory system? And it's going to be very different if you're trying to treat, say, for example, um, bladder function versus respiration. When is the best time to treat? Are we going to design an experiment that looks at acute versus a chronic state? Where should the cells be delivered? Um, and again, that's going to feed back on uh, what types of, who are the cells that you're using? What is the organ um, intended uh, for treatment? Um, when is the, the right time to treat? All of these um, questions are to be considered uh, in parallel. And why is cell therapy a valuable treatment option? Um, and um, again, you can't really separate these questions. These questions are both interdependent and need to be considered um, together. 
So with these questions in mind, I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about a very rich history in uh, the transplantation of a particular cell type. And these cells come from the developing spinal cord. So this is a cross-section of the embryonic rat spinal cord that has been um, used or studies have been done since the 1800s. But really the um, bulk of the work that has been done um, was in the late um, 1980s, done by, for example, by Dr. Paul Ryer. Um, all of these studies really showed some pros in using these developing cells to treat the injured spinal cord, such as these cells are um, inherently rich in spinal neural progenitors. They're also inherently rich with these spinal interneurons that we know have uh, the capacity to repair the injured spinal cord, and they've been clinically tested. Those studies also revealed some cons. So for example, the long-term phenotype of these cells is not known. Um, and it's uh, not uh, the optimal cell source for clinical translation. But we can still learn a lot from these studies. For example, more often than not, these developing cells, when transplanted into the injury as depicted here, they can proliferate to fill the injury cavity, and they can restore some uh, morphology that looks like the normal spinal cord. These developing cells also pr produce or provide new populations of neurons, um, interneurons, for example, and glial um, cell types. But again, when we're considering the types of cells to use, we have to consider the question of what is the intended target that we're trying to treat. And those types of cells that we want to transplant will be very different when we're trying to treat bladder control versus um, promoting locomotor function versus promoting a, uh, a motor circuit such as the respiratory circuit, which is primarily the focus of my dissertation. The other question to consider is, when is the best time to treat? So I wanted to put this schematic up to show you the difference between um, when considering what cells to use and um, when considering whether to uh, use those cells acutely when the injury cavity itself is constantly changing um, or within the chronic state when the plasticity has subdued. In parallel, we have to consider where should we transplant these cells. So it's going to be very different if you're trying to treat the acute state with a particular cell type um, versus the chronic state, um, and whether you want to be treating the injury cavity itself, or um, if you want to inject those cells um, out and uh, away from the cavity to promote other types of repair. And with all these questions in mind, I wanted to throw this data slide. Now, um, I promised myself not to have too much data, but I think this is an incredibly important slide because it summarizes more than, uh, a little more than uh, a decade worth, worth of work from Dr. Lane's lab. So here, what you're looking at is respiratory function, or the function of the diaphragm in an experimental setting. In white, you're looking at uh, injured animals that were not treated with cells. In blue, you're looking at injured animals that received these basic building blocks, uh, developing uh, uh, basic bu building blocks of the spinal cord. And already you can see that there is this bifurcation of responders and non-responders, a concept that we discussed last night with Dr. Silver's work. When we transplant or give uh, these injured animals yet another uh, source of building blocks, um, technically similar developing stage, et cetera, we see um, this heterogeneity and this variability in the functional outcome yet again. Um, but these animals are now being immunosuppressed. Yet another question that we constantly consider in our preclinical designs, as most people will be under immunosuppression when they receive cells. And lastly, when we refine these populations to those lineage-restricted cells, different from the, all of the bu basic building blocks, we can see that we can uh, limit that variability, but maybe perhaps limiting the efficacy. And this then um, makes us ask the question of why these cells are behaving differently um, from the other cells that we've tried. This data really sparked um, us taking a step back and looking at this developing spinal cord that has been studied for uh, decades now. We took a step back and we really tried to define what are those cells that we're putting in. We know that the developing spinal cord is home to a variety of spinal interneurons. They're both sensory in function as well as motor function. 
And if we look into literature, we know that if we are to transplant these motor interneurons versus sensory interneurons, um, we know that these motor interneurons promote the recovery of a motor circuit, giving us a clue for which types of cells we should be using to promote the recovery of a motor circuit. Next, we know that when we dissect out this tissue, we cut very close to the cell body of these motor neurons. And so these motor neurons don't survive the actual um, dissection. We then um, had some studies that revealed that these, uh, um, a particular type of interneurons survive the dissection and are transplanted, but these interneurons are inhibitory. And we know that there is a population of those red V2A excitatory cells in the developing spinal cord that we have also identified to promote respiratory or breathing recovery after a spinal cord injury. All of this really to show that um, there's a number of evidence that has lined up that uh, pushed us to really have this goal of enriching for these particular types of interneurons, identifying the who in our uh, five key questions. So we uh, had this goal of enriching for these V2A spinal interneurons, and to do so, we collaborated with a very talented um, uh, cellular engineer, Shelley Sakyama Albert, who has the capacity of actually generating um, these spinal interneurons. And when we transplant and compare these injured, untreated controls to our lineage-restricted recipients, to these lineage-restricted cells, combined with our particular phenotype of an interneuron, we can see that we can actually increase the efficacy of these cells, but yet again, resulting in variability. All of this to really say is that cell transplantation is just one treatment and that there is no silver bullet. Um, and that the fact that there are combinatorial treatment strategies that are being explored, such as combining rehabilitation with a cell therapy within the preclinical setting, or even combining some of the exciting FES um, systems that are already um, in people and helping people. And with that, I wanted to thank um, all of my collaborators, as well as the key graduate students that have contributed to all of this work, and of course, our funding sources, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Lana. Sorry. <laughs> and I don't see Alina. Where'd she go? Okay. All right. Well, let's let's make sure she's not just coming around. Uh, one thing, just in the minute while we're transitioning, is uh, one reminder, the live stream that's been streaming yesterday and today will be available for the next 60 days. So you might, if you have any interest or want to refresh, uh, you can certainly register for that on our website. It's free. Um, and then you can reference back some of the uh, presentations and find them along the stream. Okay, so good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so we'll jump and we'll hopefully get back to Alina after Dr. Parr. Um, Dr. Parr and I met quite a while ago uh, from Minnesota um, and um, have been following some of her research for some time and presented a few years ago in Minneapolis. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, how things have changed. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Parr from 
uh, University of Minnesota. Um, I've seen many Minnesotans out there, so uh, I'm excited about that. Um, and thank you to the organizers and to, to Matthew for inviting me here to, to speak today. It's really my pleasure. Um, and I think this uh, conference is really important to, you know, it's really an opportunity to, uh, um, to talk to the, uh, you know, the consumer of, the, of our services and our, of our research um, and give you an, really an opportunity to uh, ask some questions. Um, and so today I've entitled, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, I've entitled my presentation, Regionally Specific Spinal Neural Progenitor Cells in a 3D Dimensional, a three -dimensional Bioprinted Scaffold, Why Specificity Matters. And I kind of wanted to talk more than just going through my research about really the thinking behind it and kind of explain uh, why I think these things are important and why they're going to be important for translating uh, stem cell therapy uh, to actual clinical practice. And so, so this is the uh, Merriam-Webster definition of specificity, and what I was really getting at was this uh, first uh, definition here, the narrowness of a range of substances with which an antibody or other agent uh, acts or is effective. And I'm really glad that I followed the last presentation because I, I think that that was really a, a great presentation and it was really something to, to build upon. And I think this really does get to the who, what, when, where, why, and being really specific and deliberate about the questions that you're asking. And that's really my point here. So we know that too many clinical trials have failed uh, and we don't understand why. We know that there's been a lack of translation from rat to human studies. We know there's been a lack of translation from acute or subacute to chronic. Um, and we really need uh, to understand mechanism and avoid oversimplifying the questions. And in this age of pre precision medicine, we also uh, need to really think about patient-specific therapies. And again, uh, that comes to uh, being very deliberate and specific. And so here I put a picture, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall. Many of you are familiar with this saying. And I think in the past, uh, when we talked about cell therapies, this was the problem. We were throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what would stick. And we weren't being deliberate about the questions that we were asking, and I think this has led to some failure um, in clinical trials. So in my lab, we're very interested, most interested in chronic spinal cord injury. And so this is the main point of acute versus chronic injury. Neuroprotection is not going to work in chronic injury. What I mean by this is, is quite simple, really. When you have an acute spinal cord injury, you have three cell populations. There are dead cells, they're dead, they're not going to come back to life. There are live cells, they're fine, you don't have to do anything with them, but there's this cell population in between that are injured and dying. And you still have the opportunity to save those cells, and that is neuroprotection. In chronic injury, these cells have already made the decision to die or to live. So any uh, therapy aimed at neuroprotection really is just not going to help. And so, in my mind, I like to simplify things as much as possible. Um, so chronic injury, we only have three possible strategies. Um, and this is sort of uh, dovetails with the, with the talk that was before me as well. Number one is regeneration of the spinal cord. And this could occur through cell transplantation strategies or endogenous regeneration. And as Dr. Silver was talking about yesterday, um, taking down the neural networks, that would fall under the category of endogenous regeneration. And there are different strategies to approach this. Uh, the second possibility is reorganization of the spinal cord, and as we talked about a lot yesterday, uh, epidural stimulation or physical therapy would fall under this category. And the third category is really bypassing the spinal cord entirely, such as with brain-machine interface or exoskeleton, and I'm not going to talk about that uh, particular thing at all today, but just to be thorough. So now I'm going to talk about the specifics. I'm going to talk about five different areas that I think we need to be very specific in. And these are five areas that um, I'm working on in my, in my laboratory. So the first one is utilizing clinically relevant autologous cells. And so immune rejection is real. And so um, this is a, pater, a, pa a paper from uh, Mark Tuschinski's lab, uh, Restorative Effects, and I was hoping that the speaker that may go after me now may talk about this uh, trial a little bit. But basically, this is a great landmark paper, I think. Um, it basically showed that you can transplant human neural stem cell grafts into primates. Um, it, they differentiate and they send out axons, and axons from the monkey go into the graft and they get functional recovery, and this is great. The thing I'd like to point out about the paper, though, is that only in the last five of nine monkeys did they actually get this result. The four, first four, they didn't get this result at all. They didn't get any cell or very little cell survival, and they didn't get any functional recovery. And so the first two, they thought it was actually that the cells were washing away, that it was a technical problem. But the second two, they just, the cells just didn't survive. And then what they did was they gave them more immunosuppressive agents. And then the cells survived and they got this result. But the problem is, do you really want to have, and I underlined three drug immunosuppression in human patients, because that's going to be a huge problem. And so my last line here, and you don't have to read all of that, that's just a summary of some of the findings of the paper. 
But my last point here is too, is most rodent researchers that I know now, 10 years ago when we used to do these transplantation studies, we used to immune suppress the animals with cyclosporin. And nowadays, um, because it is still human to rat, um, so they will, the cells will get rejected. Most of us now use genetically modified rats um, because the immune suppression just doesn't work very well. And so immune rejection is real. And so I think that this is a problem. So in recent human trials, uh, they've used embryonic or fetal stem cells. Again, this is a problem with immune rejection and also ethical controversy. Um, and so in my lab, we're using iPS cells. So induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which some of you have probably heard about before, um, these were something, these were, uh, the um, person who discovered these won the Nobel Prize in medicine uh, a few years ago. Um, it's uh, Yamanaka from uh, Japan. And you can imagine how this has really um, brought forth a whole new area of medicine, of regenerative medicine. Because now what we can do is take your skin or your blood or any cell really in your body, and we use genetic manipulation. You can see in the, it's just a little schematic on the side here, to turn this, turn back the clock on these cells to make them into embryonic-like cells, and then we can subsequently culture those cells to make any of the organs in the body. So you can imagine how this is very exciting. We can make you a kidney or a liver or whatever that your, your body isn't going to reject. And so it turns out we can also make neural stem cells. So in my lab, this is what we do. Um, and by clinically relevant is that all of our protocols that we've uh, made um, are also designed for seamless transition to the clinic. And that is, um, in order to use a cell protocol in the clinic, it can't use human byproducts. You have to have very defined media, um, nothing proprietary. And so we've done that. We also use non-integrating virus, Sendai virus. Um, and so there are some people who are also working on this thing called directed differentiation, where basically you skip the iPS cell and you go directly from a skin cell to the cell type that you want. That may be a strategy that's going to work in the future. That's not what we're working on. Um, but there also are some drawbacks to that as well, uh, potentially cell yield. You may not be able to get enough cells. And also there's some evidence, which I won't really get into too much, that those directed differentiated cells will maintain their aging markers, so they're kind of old cells, um, rather than sort of turning back the clock. And so that's the most, so that's my first point, is just being specific about the cell type that you use, prevent immune rejection. So my second point here, and this is also dovetailing with the uh, presentation before, um, is the importance of regional specificity. And by this, um, so I get asked this question all the time, stem cell therapy, does it work? Well, to me, that's like asking, does pasta taste good, right? Because it depends what kind of pasta you're eating, depends who made it, and depends who's eating it. So all of these factors are really important. So you have to be specific about the questions you're asking. So as pointed out by the speaker before me, all stem cells are not the same. They typically include different types of progenitor cells. Um, and you'll also hear a lot or read a lot on the, um, on the internet about mesenchymal or bone marrow stromal cells, but I'll tell you up front that these are immune modulators. They're, and they likely provide neuroprotection. So in my mind, they're very unlikely to be of benefit in chronic injury. So I'm gonna focus on talking about neural stem cells. The other thing that we've realized recently is that brain cells don't work in the spinal cord and that regional specificity is important. So in our lab, we call our cells now not just neural progenitor cells, we call them spinal neural progenitor cells. And not only that, we call them ventral spinal neural progenitor cells and dorsal neural spinal progenitor cells, meaning they're specific to the front or the back of the spinal cord. So we've moved from focusing on the specific cell type, like neuron versus oligodendrocyte versus astrocyte, and more towards focusing on the regional specificity of the cell, because we know that neurons from the brain are not the same as neurons in the spinal cord. And so this at the bottom is another paper. This is from Stephen Stripmatter's lab, and this is a, a recent paper um, where they uh, used regionally specific cells, so we're not the only ones who have this idea. They used, theirs were embryonic derived, uh, and they, to, how do you tell that they are uh, spinal neural progenitor cells? Well, we use Hox genes, um, because those are expressed in the spinal cord, not in the brain. Um, and in their experiment, they integrate, the cells integrated into the injured spinal cord and produced functional recovery. So this is a protocol we've spent the last seven years developing, um, and we're just, we've submitted this for publication. And basically, we have a new protocol from iPS cells where we can make any of the cells in the entire neuroaxis in five days or less from iPS cells. And so these are, along the left side, these are just the different types. The, on the top, they're cortical neurons, there's um, peripheral neurons, and at the bottom, uh, there are some uh, spinal cord neurons. So I'm not gonna go into that too much detail. But, um, but, and we have transplanted these into the, into the rat spinal cord and to see what they do. Um, in our study, uh, we didn't get any functional recovery in this study, but there may be some reasons for that that I'm not gonna go into too much. Um, but basically, we showed that they survived. Again, we use these uh, genetically modified rats. 
uh, we showed that they, they differentiated. They became mostly neurons uh, with some uh, oligodendrocytes and few astrocytes. Um, and most interestingly, we found that the cell bodies uh, remain uh, around the site of injury, but they extend axons all the way up into the brain. So that was pretty exciting for us. And this is a little video of this. Um, and as the brain comes around, you'll see the axons that are extending up into the brain. Um, and so, and there are a couple of other groups that have found some uh, similar results to this. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, we use some uh, tissue clearing techniques that's on the far left. Uh, so we can actually really visual. These are some modern um, neurological uh, immunohistochemical techniques. Um, and then we can see in the brain stem and the spinal cord, the green cells. And then what we did is we actually matched uh, the uh, brains to the Allen Brain Atlas, um, which will tell us where in the brain these axons are going. And we found that they were targeting very specific areas. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'm going to move on from that to tell what else I think is important uh, to focus on. And so the other thing we're doing in our lab is we're doing some 3D printed scaffolds. And so the other thing we think is important is that in that experiment, we basically did what many other people do, which was we took the cells and we just put them right into the site of injury or around the site of injury. Uh, but the problem with that is that it's not very specific. Um, and so where we've moved to is 3D printing our cells. So what we can do, this is our little scaffold. So what we do is we, uh, we can 3D print the scaffold and at the same time we use uh, two pot printing and, or one pot printing and then we actually um, print the cells themselves in droplets. So we can put different cell types in different areas very precisely where we want them to go. And the idea behind this is that we'll be able to put our ventral neural progenitor cells in the front and the dorsal ones in the back to recapitulate the actual spinal cord. And so these are just some, uh, some pictures of this. Uh, the green uh, in the bottom are the axons. So our, our neurons do grow and they produce, uh, um, they grow axons. And the red ones are our OPCs that we also put in there in this, uh, in this experiment. So we've shown that we can print them. We can print different cell types. We can put them wherever we want them. Our neurons after printing were functionally active. We did some calcium channel imaging. And we also found, interestingly, that when we print them in this 3D manner, they actually differentiate a lot faster um, and they also form these functional networks more quickly, uh, which we thought was really interesting. Um, and so this is another finding that was unexpected uh, that we were really excited about. And that is, so we're using these regionally specific cells. And so we found that when we print them in 3D culture, they actually form mini spinal cords. And so in the, in the far panel on the left side, those ones are dorsal uh, spinal progenitor cells. Um, and uh, that's just to show we can grow those. And the ones on the, the right three panels are all our ventral spinal neural progenitor cells. And basically what these are is they're different stains taken at different areas. So the spinal cord, and you remember from the last presentation too, there's a picture of the different layers of the spinal cord. And so these auto-assemble um, and form all the layers all on their own or at least in a limited way. So when we put the ventral ones in, they form the ventral cord, and the dorsal ones form the layers of the dorsal cord. And so we're moving away from the spaghetti on the wall and moving more towards lasagna. So we have uh, uh, our layers. Um, and so this is like a very hot area right now in the brain. And so here's some recent papers in uh, Nature Biotechnology. Uh, this is from Fred Gage's lab, where he's made an in vivo model of functional and vascularized human brain organoids. So organoids is sort of a new catchphrase. And uh, here's another one from Paolo Arlotta's lab, Brain Organized. And here's a paper recently, or sorry, a poster from Nature Neuroscience that we have up in our lab um, that uh, basically shows you how to make a brain organoid and or an the second catchphrase is an assembloid, and that's where you take two different types, like I just described you, and you put them together to make an assembled brain. Um, but nobody's really done this in the spinal cord, so we're excited that uh, we may be the first to, to do that. Um, and uh, so the next thing about, so the other advantage to 3D printing is that you can print something in any shape that you want. Um, and so as you know, and I talked about earlier, every patient's injury is different, every patient is different, and their cavity is, their spinal cord cavity in their cord is different. And one of the things that's come out too with many different types of transplantation therapy is that if you, um, if the cells don't touch, nothing happens. So if you leave even the slightest gap between your transplanted cells and the native cord, uh, nothing's gonna happen. So you have to have cell to cell contact. Well, you can imagine that if you put in a scaffold that's like a square and you have this cavity that's like a football shape, then you're not gonna get anything happening. So we believe that it'd be better to have a patient specific tailored scaffold that we can print. So how do we do that? Well, uh, in the bottom row here, the second one is an MRI of a human patient. 
um, and it's, I guess, one of the ones for our East End study. And uh, basically, there's a cavity there, so we can map that using computer-aided design, and we can actually send that information to the printer, and the printer will print it, things in that exact shape. Um, so the idea is not only do you have specific cells in specific locations, you also have a specific tailored, um, a, a tailored uh, um, implant, implantable scaffold. And so this is a question I get asked all the time too. Yes, but are you really going to cut into the spinal cord to put the scaffold in? Well, I would say yes, because the, uh, so in the top right corner is a paper that came out of when I was a PhD in our lab in Toronto. It's Charles Tatter's lab um, with uh, uh, Dr. Molly Shoykat. And uh, so there was a, a grad student in the lab who was already doing this, who was already uh, putting these channels into the cavity. But this bottom part here, this is not my work. Some of you will recognize this. This is from the in vivo therapeutics trial. This is a clinical trial that's ongoing right now. It's implanting scaffolds into acute spinal cord injury. Um, and they're not seeded with neural stem cells, they're just an empty scaffold. Um, but this, they call their neurospinal scaffold, uh, they put it right into the cavity. They basically go in at the time of injury, cut open the cord, midline myelotomy, rinse out whatever this junk is in there, and then put this, uh, put this little scaffold in. So it's already being done, and it's already been approved. Um, so that's not really a, a question, and not a problem. So the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before finishing is actually the epidural stimulation and the role of epidural stimulation. And again, even in the last trial, we talked about combinatorial therapies and the, the importance of that. And yesterday we talked about, we are talking about taking down the neural network and how that might be permissive, or, to, um, or the, the perineuronal network and how that might be permissive. And then maybe you do need a component of rehabilitation therapy or epidural stimulation in order to optimize this function. And I think this is really relevant too when we talk about neuronal transplantation, because you can put those cells in and they make connections, sure, they do. We've kind of shown that and some other labs have shown that as well. The problem is, is that actually going to um, work because how do the cells know what to do and what connections to make? So that's where I think that physical therapy and epidural stimulation, which I think are, are uh, um, two sides of the same coin, um, it will help. And so this is what we do in my lab. We have something called TANES, or tail nerve electro electrical stimulation. It's already been shown to work. It's actually an easy way of using epidural stimulation um, because uh, tail, um, unlike, uh, um, unlike uh, humans, rats actually have tails, which are an extension of their spinal cord, so it's pretty easy to stimulate. Um, and so we want to use this, again, to improve survival and connectivity of new neurons. One of the talk speakers talked about yesterday how epidural electrical stimulation can reinforce connections and prevent uh, neuronal death, so we want to use this to teach the new neurons. And then um, the final thing is that, um, yes, uh, so uh, my resident yesterday, Dr. David Darrow, gave a great presentation about uh, the East End uh, epidural stimulation trial, so that's kind of where we're moving towards. So we have these things going in parallel. We're working on clinical trials for epidural stimulation, but we're also working in the lab. Um, and so I wanted to say why we have to be specific again, is that David talked about how optimization is really the key. Um, and how we have to optimize the stimulators for specific patients. Optimization for autonomic function is not the same as volitional movement, so it depends on both the patient's injury and the goals for stimulation. And finally, I would like to say that, again, epidural stimulation is a very promising treatment. However, it is unlikely to cure spinal cord injury. Again, there's going to be no magic bullet here, um, but it's unlikely to cure without other adjuvant therapies. And so, again, we use these parallel tracks of investigation. Um, and then I'd just like to acknowledge my lab members, collaborators, um, of course, all the people in the East End trial who I have acknowledged yesterday, um, and my funding sources, and especially I underline the Minnesota Spinal Cord Injury and Traumatic Brain Injury Research uh, Grant Program, um, which has been great uh, for helping to fund uh, our work. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Parr. Uh, rest assured, Alina is alive and well and coming up. Um, one little punch. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parr, for mentioning the Minnesota SCI TBI Research Grant Program. You will hear a little bit about that later today in the Cure Advocacy Network panel uh, with some of your community advocates who are here to talk about the efforts to pass legislation in other states where we have had some success. Uh, but certainly that has uh, helped to foster some of the work that you just heard from Dr. Parr. And again, uh, something I didn't mention earlier this morning is, which I think, uh, Dr. Parr, you also articulated well, is to think about where these things are happening across that continuum of discovery to translation and how these um, strategies and, and, and research are informing one another along that 
path. So please welcome Elena Garbizov, Dr. Garbizov. Um. Sorry, one second. Um. So, hi everyone. Um, I feel very fortunate to be here today. Um, I was injured four years ago as a graduate student working in a stem cell lab. And after my accident, I felt it was very important to work on spinal cord injury. So, um, I'm in the Mark Tushinsky lab now and um, with, you, with you here today. Um, so, I want to begin with an acknowledgement slide because the work I'll be talking about today is done by the very talented and collaborative people of my lab and our collaborators. And I also want to thank my funding, our funding sources. Um, the majority of the work I'll be talking about today was started by Paul Liu, who joined the lab many years ago as a recently injured postdoc. Um, he's now a fellow professor at the Center for Neural Repair. Uh, he's talked previously at this meeting and he's been a mentor to me um, and I feel very honored to be presenting his work today. Um, so I want to start by orienting you guys to how we look at spinal cord injury in the lab. We primarily work with a rat model. Um, thank you. And, uh, the work I'll be talking about is done using a severe spinal cord injury model, so a bilateral contusion, which is done by a direct impact of the spinal cord or, uh, through a, or using a complete transection, a cut through the spinal cord. The result is a large cavity lesion, very similar to what's seen in human spinal cord injury. And uh, we're interested in regeneration of the cortical spinal tract, the CST, which is the main mediator of fine motor function in humans. You can see the CST labeled here in red on our slide, um, and, and neurons of the spinal cord are labeled green here. In the cavity, in the lesion cavity, you can see that there's no neurons, and the um, axons of the CST stop at the border of the lesion. Um, you can also see labeling for GFAP, which stains astrocytes. This is the glial scar, the border of astrocytes that surrounds the lesion cavity. So there's several known reasons, some addressed at this meeting today, for why there's limited neural regeneration following spinal cord injury. Um, we think, one, there's a lack of permissive condi conditions in the lesion cavity. There's a lack of growth factors supporting regeneration. There's sources of inhibition like no-go and CSPGs. There's inflammation. And also, importantly, what I'll be talking about today is that the intrinsic growth potential of adult neurons is reduced compared to the embryonic state. Um, so our work uh, to use stem cells as a replacement therapy um, is targeting this last feature. Um, so our hypothesis is that if we transplant cells with a high intrinsic growth state, such as stem cells, we'll overcome all the inhibitory factors in the adult's injured spinal cord. Um, and our method to test this hypothesis is to transplant neural stem cells of the embryonic spinal cord into the adult environment. So uh, there's already been a great introduction to stem cells. I don't need to say much more other than instead of using embryonic stem cells, we're using these fake committed neural stem cells that can only give rise to neural tissue and have a reduced proliferative potential compared to embryonic cells. And I think this is really important given uh, the potential for tumor formation, unrestricted growth, and uh, other unwanted side effects. Um, so we use, uh, we transplant cells from rats that have been engineered to express GFP in every cell of their body so we can easily di uh, distinguish graft from host. Our grafts are always going to be green. Um, and Paul perfected this technique by using a matrix of fibrin and thrombin that gels when they mix together. This retains the cells in the lesion cavity. He also adds a growth factor cocktail that supports survival of the stem cells. As a result of this innovation, we can graft stem cells into large lesion cavities that result from severe spinal cord injury. And these cells survive and fill the lesion cavity. Um, and our, our rats are generally grafted seven to 14 days after injury, and we think this is a, a useful clinical uh, time frame for the treatment. So what do our grafts look like? You can see here an injured spinal cord that's been given a stem cell graft that has filled the lesion cavity. Yeah. 
And uh, these neural progenitor cells, they differentiate to form mature neurons, a stain here by new end staining. They also differentiate to form astrocytes. And what's interesting here is you can see there's a continuity of staining between the spinal cord and the graft. So one, the, the glial scar is gone, but two, the uh, cell type is sort of appropriate for what's seen in the spinal cord. Um, and they also differentiate into oligodendrocytes for myelination of the neurons. Um, so I think altogether this shows that uh, our cell replacement therapy is really working to make a uh, graph that's cell type appropriate for the spinal cord. And then so what's happening to these newly differentiated neurons? They extend long projections, many segments uh, into the spinal cord, uh, they form Ax, uh, axons that uh, also form synapses onto the host neurons, connecting the graft to the host. Um, so our next question was, how does this graft modify the host? And when we look at the cortical spinal tract, we see really robust regeneration of the host into the graft. And the cortical spinal tract is one of the most refractory to growth, one of the most uh, difficult to, to stimulate. And so um, what we really see here is that the um, graft has remodeled the host environment. So by transplanting cells with an intrinsic high growth potential, um, they're able to also overcome the inhibitory, remodel the inhibitory environment of the adult nervous system, such as the lack of permissive condition in the lesion cavity and a lack of growth factors, and promote the regeneration of the adult nervous system. Um, they also remodel uh, the dense astrocyte barrier, uh, the perimeter around the lesion, the glial scar. And so, uh, in summary, our neural progenitor grafts um, fill the lesion cavity with spinal cord appropriate cell types. Uh, they extend large number of processes out of the graft into the host spinal cord for long distances and form synapses connecting the graft to the host. And I think together allow, this allows for a neural relay, which is a concept that Lana introduced earlier. Um, and this relay means that we don't have to promote the regeneration of the host all the way across the, um, the lesion cavity. The graft acts as a relay to transmit the information across the lesion. So does this translate into functional recovery? And for us, the, the answer is, is a clear yes. Um, in the thoracic complete transaction, transaction uh, we have a return of motor function significantly um, in the rats that are given the graft. Um, and we also looked at recovery of a skilled reaching task in rats after a cervical injury. And again, here the grafted animals are in red. We see a significant um, functional recovery in the grafted animals. Um, so from here, we're taking our findings into two directions. One is looking at the molecular mechanism by which the graft signals to the host to promote the regeneration. Um, and the second is to try to translate these findings into the clinic, um, which is what I'll be talking about next. Um, to pursue translation, uh, we're trying to um, create a protocol for spinal cord um, for this method in non-humid primate model, um, the rhesus macaque. And this is done by um, Efren in our lab and our collaborators at um, UCSF, UCLA, and other institutions. Um, so our, pro our approach for this project uh, was first to identify the best human cell line for transplantation. Um, and we grafted a variety of cell lines to try to optimize this. This is a very difficult question, and right now we're working with the H9 human embryonic stem line, which we very carefully direct to a spinalized fate for, again, the appropriate cell type transplantation into a spinal cord. Um, and you can see a successful graft on the bottom of the screen there, and it took a lot of work to try to get our, to get our grafts to look this good. Um, so as, as Anne mentioned, our first couple of grafts basically washed away, and I think this is important to mention because in translating uh, these therapies to humans, we really need to focus on large animal models and optimizing all our methods in 
this environment before we can have a successful human trial. So something we completely didn't anticipate, the high CSF flow in larger animals washed away our cells initially, so we had to modify the matrix, we had to tilt the operating table, and um, as a result, our graph survived. We also had to, as Anne mentioned, modify our immunosuppression, so now we're using basically this protocol for humans that's used in uh, solid organ uh, don't, uh, transfers, so it, it, it works, uh, and we have subsequent good graph survival. Um, this is what it looks like in surgery. You can see the gel uh, of the matrix and the stem cells fill the lesion cavity. And again, I just wanna show you our successful graft which completely fills the lesion cavity. And like in the rat, our neurons extend large numbers of axons long distances up and down the spinal cord. Here's a slice through the spinal cord showing that the axons travel both in the white matter and in the gray matter. And I'm gonna be showing in a, a zoom in on box F where you can see in the lateral motor col column these neurons um, form at, the axons from these neurons interact with um, motor neurons and they form synapses onto the host neurons. And importantly, our human uh, grafts promote the growth of the monkey CST into the graft. So um, to assess functional recovery, we use these Brinkman boards where the monkeys have to pinch treats out of uh, different size slots from easier to harder. We also assess them um, when they're behaving naturally using object manipulation. So you can see on the affected side the sort of uh, compacted grip of, uh, of the control monkey and you can see the functional recovery uh, again on the affected side of the grafted monkey using a more open grip now. Um, so when we score the object manipulation test, we see a significant uh, improvement in the grafted monkeys. Um, and when we combine all the functional tests into one metric, we also see uh, significant functional recovery in the grafted monkeys. Uh, so where are we going next with the primate work? We're doing a lot of optimization. I think that's been like the word of the meeting to really find the appropriate cell type and the a reproducible method to create a spinalized stem cell line that's appropriate for clinical use, and this is not an easy task. Um, so, and we have grafted animals that will be monitoring for years basically to show safety of the stem cell graft. Um, and in terms of efficacy, we have about a 50% improvement in our animals. Uh, but these, the sort of the biological substrate for recovery, the uh, axon growth out of the graft is really robust. So then I guess the question that I want to pose to you guys, and maybe we can address it during the panel, is is this robust biological efficacy, the large axon growth, the growth of the host into the graft, is that sufficient to sort of justify human trials? Is a 50% improvement in recovery in the animals sufficient to justify human trials? Um, I guess that's the discussion question. Um, and then I want to finish my talk with something that I feel very strongly about is um, this is very this is new data about working in uh, chronic uh, conditions. So uh, everything I've talked about be, uh, before has been subacute. So uh, grafting seven to fourteen days after injury. We wanted to know is this protocol appropriate for the chronic state? Is this are we gonna, is this even going to work? So uh, we grafted rats six months after injury, given that rats live for only about three years and that uh, after spinal cord injury, their injury st stabilizes in, in about two months max. Uh, six months is really a definitively chronic state. So we wanted to ask, you know, will our, will our stem cell transplant even survive in the chronic environment? Um, are there axons uh, from the host still in proximity to the lesion because we know that close proximity between the host axons and the graft is necessary for regeneration. And then finally, will the host even regenerate in the chronic state? Um, so here I'm showing you what a chronic lesion looks like. Uh, you guys have seen it in some 
uh, in the previous talks too, there's really strong uh, GFAP staining for astrocytes, that glial scar that we're talking about, the neurons. Uh, and then we were happy to see that our grafts do robustly survive in the lesion, uh, even six months afterwards. And as you can see, they continue to remodel the glial scar. So you can see that the GFAP staining is, is greatly reduced. Um, and then we were really happy to see that even, even in the chronic state, there's still host axons really close to the lesion site, the lesion border. They seem to actually be embedded in that glial scar, just sort of waiting um, for the right stimulation. Uh, speaking of that, when we did transplant the uh, stem cells in the chronic state, there still was regeneration of the cortical spinal tract into the graft even six months after the lesion. Um, so in summary, I've shown you that neural stem cells when grafted into large lesion cavities in the adult nervous system um, have the intrinsic growth potential to overcome all the inhibitory factors of the adult injured nervous system um, and send large numbers of axons into the host, and then they remodel the environment to allow, allow the host axons to then regenerate into the graft. Um, and they form synapse, synaptic relays that then lead to functional recovery. Um, and we're pursuing this in the translational uh, environment in the um, uh, for hum in using human spinalized stem cells in our, in our primate model and through uh, chronic studies in rats. So with that, thank you. Thanks, Alina. Yeah. Dr. Parr, come on up. Sarah, Mike, okay? Yes. All right. Well, that, that was excellent. I, I actually learned quite a bit. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I will start off the question by asking that we have various different strategies, biomaterials, stems, enriched inter neurons, neurons that promote cortical spinal tracts. It seems to me that, that the stem cells are doing quite a bit. How do you how are you going to try to target things? When you put the graphs in, they do a lot of things, but how are you learning this? When you look at motor function, cortical spinal tract versus interneurons, is there some play between you all, amongst you all? How, how might that happen? That is a loaded question. Yeah, I guess I'll start with this one. Yeah, I, I don't think that you should, you know, anybody should look at our research as being competing. I think it's actually more complementary. And in fact, I get quite a bit of inspiration from these other uh, laboratories, you know, and I had some Dr. Chuchinsky's work up when I, you know, when I was uh, presenting, and Dr. Lewis' work as, as well. Um, because I think that um, one of the things that has changed about my, the way that I look at, uh, um, neural stem cells is that I used to be a lot more focused on the specific cell type. And I think for research purposes, it is important to look at different cell types. Um, but when I was first trying to develop these protocols for um, potential cells to be used for transplantation, I used to be really you know, obsessed with getting the purest population of neurons or the purest population of interneurons, the purest population of OPCs, so we can really get at you know, uh, the, the best optimal therapy. And I think I've realized that there, there's pretty good evidence that you need more than one cell type. For example, there's a lot of evidence now that you're not going to get a synapse without an astrocyte there to uh, facilitate that. Um, and so that's why I focus more now on regional specificity rather than specific cell type. And I do think that um, these other laboratories have the same sort of approach. Um, so I think that, oh, okay. So 
Um, I think uh, how I think of it is that we have we are basically providing the neural substrate for recovery, and then we're going to go into physical therapy or electrical stimulation, and through plasticity. Um, we can try to sort of direct the graph towards the recovery that we're looking for. And ultimately, I feel like this is where human patient trials are going to come into play. Um, we, it's very hard to motivate our rats and our monkeys to do the physical therapy, and there's, um, <laughs> um, it, and so working with a human population that has the motivation that gives us detailed feedback, that's going to be a completely different ball game. Or employing some uh, non-invasive rehabilitation strategies. Um, so I've spent five years working with the respiratory circuit, and um, we don't need to ask our rats, for example, to go on a treadmill or um, to perform. So we do something that's called intermittent hypoxia training, for example. And that's a form or can be used as a form of rehabilitation by just changing the types of uh, gas that the animal is breathing. Um, and it has, is being used within the uh, uh, injured individual population as well. So not only are we teasing apart of how this particular rehab strategy is working, um, but we're also combining it and um, seeing if we can direct both cell specificity and cell connectivity by using this um, means of rehab that's non-invasive. Let's open it up to the floor for other people to ask any questions. Please come to the microphone. There's, uh, I see a hand up there. Great talk this morning. I, I think they have brought us to basic cells which we were not clear over this and bringing back to us. My question is to Dr. And par. So the cell types you're using, are you using in rodent models or which model those cells are being derived at? And when you're looking at your specificity and going forward, is your translation in acute, chronic, which populations and have you thought about having them at cervical levels or thoracic levels? What, what is your translation of these cells into? Which population? Okay, there's, there's a little bit of echo up here, so I hope I heard your question correctly. Um, you're asking me what, uh, what population we're targeting with these cells, whether it's acute or chronic, cervical or thoracic. Um, and so our lab is focused on uh, chronic spinal cord injury um, that uh, um, we sometimes use an acute model in rats um, just uh, to show, first of all, that our cells survive and kind of to look at what they do. But that's not really our ultimate goal. Um, and I think when we talk about mechanism and as our, my, the other presenters um, presented the concept of a relay, and I think that is something that is going to be very important for chronic spinal cord injury, and that's ultimately our target. Tar our targeted mechanism is a relay mechanism, um, and that's what we're looking at. As for cervical versus thoracic, um, right now we're using a uh, thoracic contusion injury, there is potentially a problem, which I didn't really get into, but there is potentially a problem with cervical injuries as far as the scaffolding goes. And that is that while I said that, you know, we can cut into the spinal cord, we can do a midline myelotomy with, in the thoracic area with very little potential complication, it is a little bit different in the cervical cord because you have to cut the crossing fibers. And if you do that right over the area of um, hand control, if a patient does have hand control, um, then that's a potential risk. Um, and so specifically, I think the cells themselves could potentially work in a cervical injury, but I think the scaffolding might not. Great talks today, guys. Uh, I was here uh, 2016, and, and the progress you guys have made from then until now is really incredible. Thanks. Keep it up. Um, I think maybe I'll go to the question that was posed in the last talk about the uh, 50% increase. Is it worth it to look at doing some trials in acute? Because I know you wanted to have that discussion. Um, and, and I'm kind of curious about that, too. Uh, 
not that it's applicable to me per se, but just the idea of if that, let's say that that did work and you were able to show in an acute trial that you got some movement back or whatever, some functional uh, gains in the acute population, if you got it to a, you know, a, whatever, a B stage clinicals trial where you were actually looking at efficacy or if it actually was giving some functional, what do you think that would do to the whole research in general? If 50% was enough and you're throwing these in and it's also talking about immune suppression would be as part of that as well, I'm sure. And uh, some obviously side effects. Do you think that would help um, the rest of the researchers get, say, hey, look, we're making progress? Or everyone say, hey, it's cured, we've got 50%, uh, let's just throw up our hands and, and be done. I guess that's more of a question for you guys up there. What do you think would happen if you did go to clinical trials and saw some good results or not? Well, what are the pros and cons? And I guess that's kind of the discussion you want to have, so I'll let the panel up there talk about that. I think this is a conversation that we constantly have in our lab because there have been um, clinical trials that started with different stem cells, sort of, sort of not the kind of optimized uh, stem cells that we, specialized stem cells that we've been talking about, but sort of the um, more, more your garden variety. And, and they have not been shown uh, to, to have an effect, or it's kind of still early days, but um, I do think that trials that, that don't show an effect negatively impact the field as a whole, so we have to be very slow and very cautious. Um, because I think there will be stem cell burnout. Um, it might even be approaching, because I think in the beginning when stem cell came out, people were like, let's put them everywhere. They'll, and, and then now that clinics are popping up where people can go abroad and, and get some very shady stem cell transplant, or they can uh, get mesenchymal stem cells injected into their shoulder in the United States and LA, um, people are now sort of burning out on stem cells, the promise is sort of being broken, and I want that to not happen. I want it to still be a shining beacon to really rally the field. So, you know, I'm, I'm still a postdoc, but my intuition is that we really want to wait till we can have a, a, a knock it out of the park trial and not a trial that kind of can um, disappoint people again. I think that um, I echo Alina's um, thoughts here, um, but I also think that despite um, not producing the results that we were all hoping for, I think we learned a lot from all of these clinical trials. And whether that be logistics or just going through and setting up a clinical trial, and with the talks yesterday of the next therapy or the next the next uh, uh, treatment that we might come up with to be also covered or to have all of these things on our minds. So I think despite uh, maybe not functionally resulting in um, the most optimal uh, things that we were thinking that these uh, clinical trials might have, I think we've learned quite a bit from just the design part and the logistics behind all of those clinical trials. And we should continue on learning from um, both the the cells that do work in the way that we expect and uh, in the cases that they don't work in the way that they expect because, or we expect, because we can learn quite a bit from um, the data that surprises us if we take the time and really look at what we actually um, have done and what we actually have produced. Uh, Dr. Parr, you talked about like using like regenerating and regrowing, and I know I'm part of the East End trial, and so that precludes me from every stem cell study that will ever be done, but is there ever going to be a time when you can use both to try and not only like regenerate cells, but help them, like have them relearn, but also grow new ones? Like, so will there ever be a time that I might be able to do both and restore more function than just what I've already seen? Yeah, that's a, a great question, and actually that sort of was going to be my an part of my answer to the last question was actually the combination of, uh, of therapies, and, you know, we have the ESTAN trial, but as you know, one of the, the limitations of epidural stimulation is um, you can only work with what a person has, and if a person has, even though they're all Asia A's or B's, 
injuries are even within those categories. That's sort of a gross definition of, you know, of what's seen clinically, but the actual histological um, appearance of the people's spinal cords is very, can be very, very, very different. And if you don't really have much left um, in terms of remaining axons, then you're not going to get a really robust recovery with epidural stimulation as somebody who has lots and lots of axons left might. And there's other reasons why you may get a different, a different result. Um, but I think that I would not say that you will never be eligible for a, a, a stem cell transplantation trial. That's not true. Actually, I, um, I recently was on, a, I'm, was on an advisory board for an up-and-coming company uh, that's looking at transplanting autologous uh, neural stem cells for spinal cord injury, and I read their, one of my jobs was to read their protocol and to give some feedback. I was actually surprised when I read their, their protocol that they didn't have um, in their exclusion criteria, having been involved in other trials such as epidural stimulation or so in the past, that wasn't in there. Um, and so I thought, because I always thought too, you know, kind of, we warn patients about, oh, if you get in one trial. I think that for a lot of patients, if you get one type of stem cell therapy, then I think it'll probably preclude you from uh, other studies and, and certain things. But I, I, I think that actually, um, in order to move, like, I think at this point everybody realizes that, like I said earlier, there's not going to be like one magical cure, one magical silver bullet, and it's going to be a combination of things. So we push forward with the things that we know are helping people now, like epidural stimulation, but I think at the end of the day, those patients who get epidural stimulator and then you're excited in the first little while to see all this new improvement, but then some people, they hit a wall, and then you want to move on with, with other parallel lines of research. <coughs> Corinne, hang on one second. I just want to make a quick comment um, in response to that sort of question about, um, you know, the 50% and what's good enough. Just to think about, and it's not a question, it's really just to think about how big is small. So yesterday we heard Laszlo Negi say he can, he can smell, and all he wants is his name on a mailbox so he can live independently. That, that question of how big is small, those small improvements, how meaningful are they? But the tension is on the flip side, if we were to talk to some folks in industry, how small can be big enough to attract investment and market and the machinery necessary to get out there because you don't get many shots. And so I just wanted you to think about that sort of inherent tension. You know, our community will take something small because it's very, very meaningful but that doesn't necessarily translate out into the world and how that's an that's something we have to figure out. Sorry, Corinne. Hello. Um, thank you for those excellent presentations. It was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions for Dr. Parr. Uh, the first question is about uh, organoids. Um, it seems to me that it's a very exciting area. How far do you want to bring it? Uh, and can we dream that one day, and I know it's not for tomorrow, uh, we will be able to have uh, um, some trials uh, based only on those uh, organoids and especially in chronic setting. Uh, so that's the first question. And also, do you have any cooperation? Is that one area where there sh maybe I, I'm thinking it's so complex and so um, innovative that maybe it would be good to have a, a platform of cooperation uh, on that? I know there is another group uh, working on the subject. Uh, my second question is about the, the 3D scaffold. Um, what's the difference between your approach and the approach of uh, the Tuzinski group and also in vivo? Uh, because it's also a scaffold uh, with um, well, so 3D scaffolds with stem cells. And how do you make sure that you get um, a clinically relevant uh, animal model? Because that seems to me to be very complex. Yeah, those are a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think that, um, to, I'll just sort of address them maybe not in order, but um, I think that the, what is the difference between what Dr. Chusinski's lab is doing and my lab? I think we're actually very complementary in, in what we're doing. 
Um, I think that um, it's important for individual labs, too, to replicate findings. Um, so we're working in parallel tracks. We, I know from reading his papers, we have a lot of the same ideas and we're approaching things. And I have, he's come as a visiting professor and we've talked about this um, before. Um, right now, uh, his scaffolds, he just published a paper on scaffolds. He's not 3D printing his scaffolds. I know he's tried that in the, in the past. Um, we are 3D printing our scaffolds and our cells. There's drawbacks and the, uh, there's potential drawbacks or advantages to both to both strategies. Um, I think they're both worth worth pursuing, um, kind of to see uh, where that goes. Um, as for the uh, clinical relevance of the animal model, that's a, a great question too, because one of the things that I've run into is that. <sighs> Using a clinical, clinically relevant model isn't always the best strategy, um, especially when you're looking at a relay mechanism. Because one thing is that I've always said I'm never going to use a transection model because I'm like that doesn't really happen in humans. Why would I do that? It's a different pathophysiology. But I've actually recently gone back on that, and a recently a grant that I wrote was um, uh, using a transection model. And the reason is that it was an NIH grant, and the um, the focus really is on mechanism, you know, and the NIH is very much like you have to show the mechanism. And so our proposed mechanism, as I stated, uh, is, a re is a relay of the neurons. Um, but the best way to show that is actually to definitively show that is to use a transection model because then you can say, okay, there were no axons before, there was no nothing across this site, and now there is. Whereas a contusion model is just a little bit difficult to show what's been um, preserved versus what's regenerated or what's forming this relay. Um, and so I understand that that is like, it's, it was a bit of a struggle for me finally acquiescing to using this transection model. Um, so we use different models. And the other thing, as I said, you know, I'm mostly interested in chronic spinal cord injury, but I also sometimes use an acute model, and it's usually to get preliminary data. Um, just because, it, very practically speaking, a chronic model is really expensive because you have to keep those animals in house for a long period of time, and then some of them die, so you have to replace, you know, all these sorts of things uh, to do with animal care. Oh, the organoids, yeah. Um, and so the the organoids, as far as um, I think you asked about collaboration. So we have I have some collaborations within our, our stem cell institute um, because there are some people that are actually growing brain organoids for for use, not for transplantation. Mostly they're used for drug testing. Um, and so uh, we have that that collaboration. Um, I think as far as uh, transplanting and sort of time frame as to when this is going to get to clinical trial. I think, again, that's going to be a really hard question to answer. Um, I think I, I agree with you, you know, in that we want to take our best shot and we want to make sure that things are, are safe. Um, and the one thing we, we don't really know yet is so there's, you know, some very exciting work that we know these neurons, these spinal cord neurons can send out axons and graft axons will, um, uh, our host axons will grow into these grafts and they form these connections. The big question is also also going to be, you know, how do we prevent aberrant connections and how do we prevent negative things from happening? I mean, this the whole conversation came up yesterday too. We're talking about taking down uh, uh, neural networks um, and whether that is going to have some some negative effects when systemically. I mean, it's always the big question is you have these exciting findings, but you really have to show safety before translating. Just to, to clarify, you end targets with the, the organoids is transplant. It's not to, to have a platform to try uh, therapies. That's another... Oh, um, well, with the organoids, that's the beauty of it, is you can actually do both. Mm -hmm. You can use them to, in a dish um, to show, to test different things. Um, we could make spinal cords, we could injure them in a dish and try different drug therapies. That's not really the goal of our uh, lab. Our, the goal of our lab is we're really looking at um, eventual translation and, and transplantation strategies. Um, but, um, but we also can share these organoids with other groups. We do that frequently. We send cells off to other labs who request them um, for different purposes. So I, I have one question. I need to get in here because I, I, I've been dying to ask. And from the audience perspective, so we're talking about scaffolds mixed in. We're talking about neural enriched populations, whether they're interneurons or otherwise. What I want to ask is a numbers game. So you're you're putting in with scaffolds or without scaffolds the cell types, and a lot of them turn into these hugely gross graphs of neurons. 
And I think sometimes I'm alarmed personally because I'm like, that looks like a neuroma. That looks like a cancerous growth. So I want you to kind of maybe address to the audience what the risks of these things are, whether they're precursors or progenitors that you're putting in and calling them stem cells, of them down the road growing into an elbow joint. So I, I want to address this by saying um, when we took embryonic stem cells and we put them into nude rats, which are rats that don't have an immune system, we did have sort of outgrowth of these cells sort of uh, enlarged grafts, um, and we, we became very worried. So this is at the forefront of our mind. This is why we're taking our, our embryonic stem cells and we're directing them to this spinalized fate, and as you restrict the fate of the stem cells, you diminish their proliferation proliferative potential. And actually one of the other things we're looking at is basically building in a fail-safe switch into our cells, uh, a genetic mechanism where we will be able to either kill the dividing cells or kill a fraction of the population if we do see any um, sort of out uh, out of control growth. So our, uh, our idea is that when we do transplant these cells, because they are stem cells, and though they are specified to be spinalized and have a reduced proliferative potential, we want to have that fail-safe mechanism to protect our patients, basically. One, one last question, and then we're going to take a break. When you were talking about immunosuppression, I imagine that it's like when someone gets a organ transplant and their body rejects it. So if you were to take my cells and make them into stem cells, wouldn't that be a non-issue of rejection? So no. So that, that's, um, that's the whole idea behind using either iPS cells or directed differentiation. So. Um, you may read that, so obviously if you take something from somebody else and put it in you, um, whether it be a solid organ or bone marrow or something, your, your body's going to reject it, and you can match that, um, like you'll hear about um, like if you, people that get liver transplants, um, so that means they're less likely um, because they're more similar to that person, uh, so they need less immune drugs, but you still need immune suppressants. With, um, embryonic or stem cells, the embryonic cells themselves actually are immune privileged, but the problem is you don't use embryonic cells. You then differentiate them into the cell type that you want, and then as soon as you start differentiating those cells, they start expressing markers on their surface, which make them, uh, which make them immunogenic. So you would then reject those cells. If you take your own cells, and turn back the clock and then subsequently culture those cells, or you use directed differentiation where you take your own cells and genetically manipulate them to become something, those cells will still express the same markers of yourself, and so your body will not reject those. It's as if you have your own kidney back, or your own liver back, or your own brain cell back. One more, maybe? Anybody have, did you, did you still want to ask? No? Okay. Uh. Hi, good morning. Thank you for your all's talk. Um, I just had a quick question in regards to um, the stem cells. Have you guys done any, I guess, electrophysiology or have any measurements to assess if these stem cells are currently electrically or chemically um, functioning with the residential neurons? Uh, yeah, so I didn't show those findings, but we have uh, part of the relay is that there is um, good electrophysiology now uh, through the graft, and that uh, isn't seen with non-grafted animals. So yes, the, the neurons do uh, conduct through, yeah, the, the synapses are functional. Yes, we use patch clamping as well as slice electrophysiology. I have a collaborator um, who has a lot of experience in that area. And so one of the things we've shown with our regionally specific cells, it, when we print them into the 3D scaffold, is actually they mature. Their pattern, electrophysiological patterning, doing patch clamping, they actually mature much faster in the 3D scaffold versus a traditional 2D culture. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And since we're going to break, the, you can ask more questions and continue the conversation. 
Um, we're going to take a 30-minute break. One little quick reminder, as I mentioned earlier, we do have an event survey. We want to hear from you. We want to give, get feedback from you so we can improve what we do. If you do not have the Whova app, you can find a link to it on our website. It's our conference app. A lot of folks are talking about a lot of things. And uh, that's another place where you can um, click that event survey. So let's have a break. And when we come back, uh, we'll continue the conversation. Thanks. <laughs>